Well, wow, that was a very warm welcome. Thank you. I don't think I've ever had such a, such a warm welcome. So, hi, I'm Leah. It's great to be here. Uh, before I start, uh, before I go into the actual content of the talk, here's a fun fact about me. Even though I live in Boston, I'm actually originally from Greece, uh, and specifically from the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian, probably the first you've ever met. <laughs> Seriously, that's what the word lesbian originally meant, someone from Lesbos. Every other meaning came later. <laughs> So I'm really into open source. I've released a few open source projects. You may have used some of my work. Uh, I'm, in the, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group, which is the group that designs the CSS language, decides what gets, out, what gets added, what doesn't. There is me up there. Um, as part of my, my day job is doing research at MIT, and specifically, I work in, on this language called Mavo, which is basically a way to develop entire web applications by just writing HTML and CSS without having to deal with JavaScript, server-side backends, any of that stuff. If you do, you can, if you do know about that, you can do more with it, but like, you don't have to deal with it at all to just create uh, web applications with it. So, let's get into the meat of the talk. It's called Even More CSS Secrets, and I want to explain first why it has this title. So a few years ago, it dawned on me, why do, I, why do we have to focus on a specific thing for a talk? There are so many cool things happening in CSS. There are so many interesting things. Why just focus on one? Why not just do like a talk where I share all the things that I think are interesting right now about CSS? So I did that, and I called it CSS3 Secrets because back then CSS3 was a buzzword. That was like 2011, 2012. And these were the, the 10 secrets. If you, take a, if, you, if you take a moment to look at them, you might find some of them interesting. You could look up the talk on YouTube. Uh, and then I did a sequel called More CSS Secrets, 10 Things You May Not Know About CSS, which was another 10 things I considered cool at the time and wanted to share with people. So then uh, I, combi I combined those with a few more of these things, and I wrote a book in exactly the same concept, like 47 things that you may not know about CSS. It was translated in a bunch of languages, sadly not Spanish. Sorry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't decide what, which languages it gets translated in. It didn't get translated to Greek either, which made me very sad. And today, I want to do another, a third sequel of this kind of series, even more CSS secrets, another 10 things that I want to share with you that I think are cool about CSS. So without further ado, the first one, I called it cutout text, because it's basically this effect of the title, where you have a solid background, and it's the text that is actually cut out, and you see what's behind it. And how many of you have used Photoshop? Most of you, well, about half, I would say. How many of you have used blending modes in Photoshop? Multiply, screen, all those. Excellent, about half of you. So usually, at, for, at least when I started using Photoshop, and for many, many years, I had no idea how these blending modes really worked. I would just try them all, and eventually I would find the one that did what I wanted. So usually, the way blending modes work, and yes, we, we can have blending modes in CSS now, is you would get an element that is sort of translucent and sort of blends with the background, but I didn't quite know exactly how it worked. So actually, it turns out that if you look into the algorithm that defines these blending modes, multiply is called multiply because the color components you choose are just multiplied together, and that's how you get the result. You express both colors you have uh, on a scale from 0% to 100%, and then you just multiply the percentages together. So you can see here how it works with this example. And if I keep changing the color here, you can see what happens. Notice that the color you get with multiply is always at least as dark as the darkest of your colors, which is a very useful property. One thing that is useful is that when you have black, when you have black, you always get black with multiply, because you multiply every component with zero. And what do we get when we multiply a number with zero? We get zero. 
And similarly, when you have white, you always get the other color because you're multiplying every component with 100%. And what do you get when you multiply anything with 100%? You get that thing back. So how can we use that in this case? Let's go back to our example. So now you understand why you got this sort of like darker heading that was like both darker than the original heading you were blending and the backdrop. And if we change color and make it white, you will see that now it became a hole, it became a cutout. But our background is still sort of translucent because we're, it's still being blended with, with whatever is behind it. But there is one color we can use where we will get back that exact color. And that color is black. So if we put background black there, then we should get a black background with cutout text. And hopefully the AV will, will work with me this time. But if not, you can see what was going to happen. Yes. And I'm going to remove it now. Actually, I'm going to make it 001, because that doesn't trigger the problem. But you can see how it works. And now you might be wondering, OK, that's, that's cool when I want a black element with a cutout, with cutout text. What if I want a white element with cutout text? How do I do that? Well, you're in luck. You have to use, it's a similar technique, but it's a, different blend, it's a slightly different blending mode. It's the blending mode called screen. How many of you have used screen in Photoshop as a blending mode? Fewer. I think multiply is probably the most common one. So the way screen works, you can see the math there, which actually looks super complicated. But it's actually, more, it's actually simpler than it looks. You basically invert the color you have, inver invert the two colors, multiply them, and then invert the result. That's basically what, what this formula is doing. That's why it's subtracting everything from 100%. And this gives you the opposite result. Let's see, uh, let's see a few more colors. Let's see, for example, magenta, how that works. You see you get white here. Let's try, I don't know, HSL, something sort of in the middle. This is like one of my favorite grays. And you can see how it works. Screen always, always gives you something that is at least as light as the lightest of your two colors. It's kind of the opposite of multiply. I can play with it a little bit to show you what happens. But actually, what we care more about is how does this blending mode help us to achieve a cutout text effect? And for that, notice how it works with white and black. If you have white, you always get the, you always get white. It doesn't matter what, what you had here, you always get white back. It's sort of the opposite uh, property that multiply had. And if you type black here, you always get the other color. In this case, red, but it could be anything. Papaya whip. Whatever. So how do we apply this in our cutout text? So if we make the background white, and now we don't see anything because they're both they're multiplied. Let's change the blending mode to screen. And I typed a rogue S here. And all right, and the closing brace. So you can see that now if I have a, a screen blending mode then and reverse the two colors, I have white as a background and black as a, as a, as a text color, I get the opposite effect, where it's a white background and the text is cut out on it. So after that, I, I was getting greedy. And I was wondering, OK, this is cool if you have white and black, and that's kind of more common. But how can you get this effect with other co colors? Can you? So I, I made this little app to test like different blending modes and see whether there is any blending mode that would help me there. So this is showing you how different colors work uh, over different colors. So the foreground is the horizontal stripes. The background is the vertical stripes. You can see the heading there if you forget that. Here's multiply, for example. And you can see why it gives us the effect we want. There is one color where it's always the same color, no matter what it's on. It's the black. And there is one color that always gives you the background, regardless of what color it's on, and that's the white, which is exactly why multiply helps us get cutout text on a black background. Screen has the opposite property. Notice that with screen, white is always white, and black always gives you what's behind it. 
Are there any other blending modes with a similar property? So here you can see all the blending modes. But sadly, and you can play with this at home. My slides are online. Sadly, none of them had this property, both of these properties together, for, an, for, for something different than white and black. Because white and black, we've already found a way to do them, so it doesn't help. Like, yes, there are other blending modes that would give you the same effect with white and black, but that's no use. So sadly, I haven't found a way yet to do it with other colors, at least not in, an, in a non-awful way, without like overlaying text twice and horrible things like that. If you come up with something, you should publish it, you should blog, you should blog it, I will retweet you, let me know. So you might be wondering at this point, <laughs> what's the browser support for mixed blend mode? Actually, it's decent. It's very decent. It's been supported by almost every browser for years now, except Edge. And Edge is switching to Chromium, so that won't be a problem for long. And in terms of market share, it's 85% of users globally. So it's quite a lot. And especially if you think about, if you think that in most cases, this effect is, uh, degrades very gracefully. If I remove the blending mode here, I just get black text on a white background. Or when I had, the, when I had the, the, the cutout text on black, if blending modes are not supported, I just get white text on a black background. It's actually the best contrast you could ever hope for. So some takeaways. With, with the multiply blend mode, black is cut out and white is opaque. With the screen blend mode, white is cut out and black is opaque. And I haven't found a way to do this with other colors. So the next thing I wanted to share today is called characters as images. How many times have you needed to use actual text, like an, an emoji or a special symbol or a nice quote, or like a fancy quote symbol as, an, as a background image, or in general, in CSS, as an image? And there was really no way to do it except opening Photoshop, pasting in the character, and actually exporting it as an image. So it turns out there is a way to do this straight in CSS. This background is all just CSS. And that way is called SVG in a data URI. How many of you have, uh, can, can read SVG code? Chris, you don't count. <laughs> Chris here started SVG. Um, but OK, so how many of you know what SVG does? OK, about like one third. So SVG is a markup-based format for vector graphics. Vector graphics let you um, resize them to every dimension, and they, you don't see any pixelation, any distortion. Uh, SVG has been supported on the web for many, many, many years. Uh, if you've worked with Illustrator, for example, that's vector graphics, and you can export it to SVG. So most people, when they use SVG on the web, they Use, uh, they use it as external files, like URL something dot SVG. However, there is a lot of power in defining an SVG right in your CSS via data URI, as you can see here. So this is what a simple SVG file looks like. This just defines a red circle um, with, uh, this, uh, with its radius. For example, here I made it bigger, with its center, Oops, now I made it off the screen, and so on. And you could actually, you could use background size to make it smaller. Then you get lots of circles. But circles are not very exciting. You could have circles with, uh, by abusing radial gradient as well. The thing is, once you can write SVG straight in your CSS code, there's so many things you can do. Basically, there's all this power that SVG has that CSS does, cannot, that doesn't have access to. For example, let's add a character here. And now we can't see it because it's very small and it's out of the screen. So first we make it lower by setting its baseline to 1M. And then we give it a font size of 90. And 90 here is rel relative to my view box. My view box is like defines the coordinates of the SVG. So this 90 is relative to that. So as you can see, the, the character actually occupies most of, my, most of my tile. So 
At this point, we already have a character as an image, but that's not very useful. It's just an A. But once we can do that, we can have all sorts of characters. For example, a unicorn or any emoji. And, and this is much smaller. It's only a few bytes. Whereas if we had to, like, to, to do this as a, as a PNG file, it would be like quite a lot bigger. And furthermore, we can use CSS in SVG. So yes, we can have CSS in our SVG, which is in our CSS. It's, there's a bit of inception going on there. One thing to notice is that you always need to escape new lines when you're doing this. Otherwise, stuff will break. And let's add a style element in this CSS file, uh, in this uh, SVG file. And how many of you have used CSS animations? Oh, OK. Uh, so we define a CSS animation with the keyframes rule. Let's call it dance. CSS animations let you animate CSS properties with certain parameters. And let's define that this animation goes to, from whatever state it's, it's on, the, the thing is on by default, to a transform of 10, pix, uh, 10 degrees rotation. OK? And now we've created this animation, but we haven't applied it to anything. So let's add a style attribute here and use the animation property and say dance one second. You can see something's happening already. And let's say infinite so that it repeats infinitely. And it, does, it looks a bit jerky, so let's, let's say alternate so that when it, when it finishes, it reverses itself and it looks more smooth. And also, let's make it faster, because that's not dancing. That's more like, I don't know, trance. So. <laughs> Thank you. So as you can see, with SVG, not only you can have characters as images, but you can animate them. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, here's another example, which is a little more conservative than dancing unicorns. Uh, here we have a star rating. I'm sure you've seen many star ratings on websites. And the only HTML we've needed for it was a meter element. And we can actually control wh what the displayed value is by setting the value attribute. And we can show fractions of stars, which actually many, many star widgets do not allow. Like how many star widgets allow us to show things like 2.7 out, out, um, out of 5. And the way we've done this is we've styled the meter element. We did need to use some proprietary CSS. So brace yourselves a bit. You will see that I've used a, a WebKit pseudo element here. And if we were using this on a real website, we shouldn't just use the WebKit pseudo class. There is an equivalent Moz one, and there is an equivalent MS one. But there, every browser supports some form of this. Uh, here, I've just used WebKit because I'm displaying this presentation in Chrome. And I didn't want to have this like five times. And notice that I also had to use the data URI twice, one to define the, the bold version of the stars, the, the black version of the stars, and want to define the faded out version. And that's because, unfortunately, I can't, you, you can't differ these data URIs. You can't use variables in these data URIs yet to make them like different based on things. Unless you're generating them with SAS or, or less or some preprocessor, then it can work. Uh, and that way, you don't need to restrict yourself in stars either. Like You could have anything, let's say, Let's say you wanted to rate chocolate ice cream. <laughs> then you could have a scale of 0 to 5 chocolate ice creams. <laughs> and as you can see, you, can, you still have the same flexibility. So the second set of takeaways, you can turn glyphs into animated images with SVG data URIs. You can use the strict to style meters with discrete icons, among many, many other things that you can do with that. Let's say you wanted to have fancy block quotes, for example, with like fancy quotes on the side. That's also a great use case. The next thing is also about using SVG in CSS. I call SVG sort of the, the, the web design cheat code, because there's so many things that it can do that CSS can't. Uh, 
Look, take a look at this border here. It has a gradient. It's dashed, but it's not in the way that dashed borders are generated in CSS, where you don't control the, the width of the dashes and gaps at all. And also, it's moving. How would you do that with CSS? You can't. But with SVG, all of these things are possible with SVG strokes. So let's see how. And we're going to take this step by step. We're going to start from a, a rectangle with a stroke. This is what it looks like. It's a rectangle, a rect element, has a width and height of 100%. And for now, I've applied a black stroke that has a width of four pixels and no fill, because by default, SVG shapes have a black fill. How can I make this dashed? In CSS, we would say border style dashed, right? In SVG, it's a little more involved. You say stroke dash array, and then you can specify exactly the width of the dashes that you want. And here, I haven't, I've only specified the width of the dashes, not the width of the gaps. So that's, that's uh, whatever it is by default. But I can also specify the width of the gaps and have different things. I could even like, do things like this and have like, Morse code on my borders, but why would you want to do that? Let's make this 10 pixels and 5 pixels. And also, there is a stroke dash offset property that lets you control where the dashes start from. So if I, keep, if I reduce this, notice that if I keep reducing it, these are moving. And they're moving like these marching ants. Like, you know, when you select something on Photoshop, for example, and you drag a selection, it's not just a dashed rectangle that you get. It also moves like this. It, it also animates. So can we use CSS animations to create this, this animation instead of like having to manually, uh, to manually reduce it? Turns out we can. One thing to note is that when stroke dash offset is 0, it's the same you get the same dashes as when it's minus 15 pixels. Because 15 pixels is the width of your dash plus the width of a gap. So it has moved exactly one, um, one dash and one gap. See, if I turn this to 0, nothing changed. So we'll take advantage of this to create a smooth animation. Let's go here, add a style element, and the keyframes animation which we'll call ants. And it will go to stroke dash offset minus 15 pixels. And let's go here and apply the animation. Let's say one second ants and infinite so that it doesn't stop at the end. So you can see that it's almost there. It's, it's, it's animating. Can you see that at the back? OK. If I make the stroke width bigger, then the, I will also have to make the gap bigger. Um, so you can see that it's, it's animating, but it's not very smooth. It does this sort of thing where it stops, and then it, it runs, and it stops again, and then it runs, and it stops again. This is because, by default, CSS animations try to help us. So the default way they, they progress is with some acceleration, which is, co which is closer to how normal movement works in the world. Normal movement is not linear usually. There is some acceleration or deceleration to it. So the default animation timing function is ease, which is like this. It has some, uh, some acceleration. But we can override that. We can specify linear. And then it progresses linearly, which is closer to what we wanted. So that gives us the, the animation we wanted. But if you notice, in the, in the first slide, we didn't just have dashes that were moving. We also had a gradient. So we'll see how to do the gradient in the next section. But first, here we just have an SVG. We don't actually have a CSS background. We haven't actually applied this to an HTML element. Right now, it's just an SVG. So let's copy what we've done here. And let's paste it into this data URI that I've conveniently started here. So notice that here I have this, this div with a class of unicorn. It says, look at my awesome border, which it doesn't have yet, but it will get one soon. 
and then I'm pasting the code here, and you'll see that in the beginning it won't work, because remember, I have to escape the new lines if I have a multi-line URL in SVG. So now that I've done this, you can see that I can have, I have that border, that SVG stroke on my HTML element. And I can insert like line breaks here, I can make the aspect ratio of the box completely different, and it still works, it still has the same dimensions. For those of you that are more advanced in SVG, the reason this happens is because I don't have a view box here. I haven't specified coordinates, so it just adapts to the coordinates of the element. So let's see now how to do the gradient border. So here, I've started from a rectangle with a thick stroke. It's this uh, zero AC color, which is, gives us this nice teal. And right now, it's a solid color. So how could I make that into a gradient? So SVG got gradients far before CSS did. So the syntax is a lot more awkward, because for CSS, we had so many years to come up with a good syntax. SVG had gradients since like 1998. Was it 98, Chris? Seven. Seven. 1997. So the syntax is more unwieldy, but it's still very powerful. So everything's element-based. So you have a linear gradient element, and inside it you have stops with a stop element and a stop color attribute and another stop for the other color. And you don't see anything yet because I've defined the gradient, but I haven't done anything with it. To do anything with it, I need to give it an ID, and then I need to go here and replace the color I had with a reference to that gradient. All right. Yes, and you have to specify an offset manually. So there it is. Now we have a gradient stroke. And also, we want to give it an angle, which is, yet, uh, which is also a little bit awkward. You have to use a gradient transform property and specify a rotation. But it works. It's a little more awkward, but it works eventually. And now we have our gradient stroke. Let's try to paste it inside our data URI. Again, it's the same div with the class of unicorn. And I have the data URI here. And let's go and paste it in and escape the lines. So as you can see now, even though I've escaped the lines, it still doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is that in, s in some cases, escaping the, the lines of a multi-line URL is not enough. There is also other, some, a few other characters that you need to escape in a data URI. Not many, but there is a few. And one of them is the hash, the hash, the hash symbol, this one. So this one is a reserved character for URLs. So it needs to be escaped. Until recently, Chrome was very forgiving, and this actually worked. But now it forces you to escape it and make it like percent %23. And we have it in two places. We also have it in the URL here. And now that I've escaped both of them, it works. And notice that at this point, even though we're using it as a stroke, it's kind of showing how it's created, because essentially it's a background. It's a background that we are making look like, we're making it look like a stroke. So it's, it, it ended up being behind our text, which is rarely what you actually want with a stroke. But you can fake this with padding. If I specify 20 pixels padding, then my text is inside the stroke. You might be wondering, why do we have a stroke width of 40 pixels, but a padding of 20 pixels and not 40? The reason is that in SVG, when you specify a stroke, half of the stroke is inside the shape, half of the stroke is outside the shape. And you can't actually control that yet. So half of our stroke is actually clipped. We actually get only 20 pixels. You might be wondering, OK, so you need to, you need to escape the hash. But, and you, you said you need to escape a, a, few more, a few other characters. How do I know which characters I may need to escape? Do I just like wonder? Do I just try different characters? No. So the URL specification, it's an IETF specification. And it has a list of reserved characters for URLs. It's the one in gen, the limbs here. 
Those are the special characters for URLs. And the reason you need to escape them is because they have special meaning when it comes to URLs. Like a hash means a URL hash. If you don't escape these hashes, how does the browser know whether, whether you're trying to define a URL hash or not? So you don't actually need to escape all of these in modern browsers. Some of them are more forgiving than others. But if something doesn't work, that would be the first thing to try. And always escape your hashes. So the takeaways from this part is, as I mentioned, SVGs with no view box spread to cover the entire area, Stroke say the same width, regardless of the dimensions of the element or its aspect ratio. And we can use this to apply fancy SVG strokes to our HTML element. And actually, I didn't even display, I didn't even show you half of what SVG strokes can do. They are, they are so powerful, so much more powerful than CSS borders. The fourth thing is about, uh, is what I call line headings. Uh, a typographic effect we often see, I mean, it's not usually animated, this was just me going overboard, but a, a typographic effect we commonly see is having a heading and the space around it is covered by horizontal lines. I mean, you see this a lot in books, articles, uh, and it, it used to be quite tricky to do with CSS in a flexible way. But recently with Flexbox and Grid, it has become much easier. How many of you use Flexbox or have used Flexbox? Great, most of you. So here we have a heading. And the trick behind this is basically that we're going to apply display flex on our heading. And then we will have pseudo elements, which at first we're going to give them a content of A just so we can see what we're doing. And also, let's give them some crazy, horrible backgrounds, again, so we can see what we're doing, which we're going to remove later. So right now, you see that it just has these A elements like on each side, and it doesn't look very pretty. First, we give, we give the heading a width of 100%, so it occupies the entire width of the viewport of, of its container. And then we specify flex 1 to the pseudo elements so that they occupy all the space that the heading doesn't occupy. So one thing to take away from this is that when we first use Flexbox, we, we're, we usually use Flexbox with actual HTML elements. But the before and after pseudo elements also behave exactly like children in terms of Flexbox and Grid. And you can style them exactly like children of the element. So now, Let's give this a nicer color, or actually current color, which corresponds to the whatever text color we define here. And let's remove this gray. And let's give this a height, let's say 0.1 ms. And we don't need the A anymore, because we can see what we're doing. We can specify a line items center, so that this is centered. And then we're almost there, except we need to specify a bit of a margin so that it doesn't collide with our element. And you can see that it works just fine already. And notice that when it gets to, to two lines, the, the, the decoration just disappears, which is basically what you, it's kind of what you would expect, right? You don't want that kind of decoration when you have two lines. And the good thing is you don't have to do anything special to avoid it in that case. It just, it just works. And there's a lot of things you can do that way. You don't have to just restrict yourself to lines. For example, let's do something slightly different. How many of you have used repeating linear gradient before? It's like a linear gradient, but it repeats. So if I specify an angle and then two color stops and a transparent color stop as well, you see that now I have like diagonal stripes and it's still just as flexible. You could do all sorts of things. You could have a rainbow there, like whatever. So the fourth takeaway is that text nodes and pseudo elements can be flex children. Are our H1 didn't actually have any HTML elements as children. The, th the, 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 the flex children in our example was just the text inside the heading and the two pseudo elements. So 
How many of you have, have tried doing a pop-up menu with CSS? I'm going to just advance there. Uh, how many of you have tried doing a pop-up menu with CSS? I think it's one of the first things we try when we learn like the hover pseudo class. We're like, oh, I can use it to make a pop-up menu where you hover over a list and then you see like the items inside the list, like this. However, these kinds of menus have a big accessibility problem. If you try to use the keyboard, then notice what happens. I press tab, I focused on projects. Where is the submenu? I don't know. There is no submenu. If I'm a keyboard user and I don't use my menu, uh, if I, and I don't use my mouse, I, will, I would never know there's a submenu there. I can tab through the top level ones, but that's, that's about it. And this is usually the way these kinds of menus are implemented. I've seen people try to fix this by having something like this, like nav a focus, by trying to use the focus pseudo class and then saying like the, the UL after a focused link should also be displayed, not just the UL inside a hovered LI. So that kind of brings us halfway there, because if I, now if I focus on projects, I can actually see the submenu. But it's kind of worse, because I can't really click on anything in the submenu. If I press tab again, it disappears under my feet. And then I press tab, and blog is focused. But I still cannot focus on anything inside the submenu. I, the submenu is there, and it's taunting me. But I can't do anything with it as a keyboard user. Same with about. So until recently, there was no way to deal with it. There was no in CSS. The only way was to add some JavaScript to make the menu accessible, which most people didn't add. So these menus were usually inaccessible. But recently, we got a new pseudo class, which kind of works like hover in the sense that you can also use it on ancestor elements. So we can say li focus within ul. Whoa, that's, yeah. So we can say uh, li colon focus within ul. And that means the, uh, the focus within pseudo class matches elements that contain a focused for a focused element. Not just elements that are focused themselves, but also elements that contain something that has focus, which is exactly what we wanted. So now, if I use the keyboard to focus on projects, I can see the submenu, and I can actually tab through it. And then I press tab again, and blog is focused. Thank you. So now the entire menu is keyboard accessible by just adding one line of CSS. And if you're wondering about browser support, it's decent. I won't say it's perfect, but it is decent. It's basically 80, almost 80% of users globally. So one out of five will still have this problem, uh, will still uh, unless you add JavaScript, one out of five will still not be able to use the keyboard with your menu. But at least it's a very quick fix that you can just like add very quickly, and it makes a menu keyboard accessible like that. Whereas like otherwise, I've seen so many menus in the wild without any keyboard accessibility whatsoever for any users. And not to mention that that percentage is constantly increasing. As as, as newer browsers get adopted, as Edge switches to Chromium. So the fifth takeaway is that Focus Within can help us improve accessibility very, very quickly. And also soon, I don't know when, but we have in the CSS Working Group, we have resolved to also add Target Within, which works the same way, but with the Target pseudo class. Now we're just waiting for browsers to actually implement it. How many of you have heard of variable fonts? So you know how you can say that a font is bold or normal or extra bold? Variable fonts or you can, are basically a generalization of this concept. Instead of having keywords and specific points for the font weight, you can have an entire continuum. And furthermore, it's not just the font weight. It's any, any aspect of the design of the font you can imagine. It could be the slant. 
like is the font upright or is it slanted? It could be uh, like a, an access for some sort of decoration in the font. In, instead of having like access to just discrete points in the font design, we have access to the entire design space. As an example, take a look at this six over there. Its weight is animating, which is something you cannot do with a non-variable font because you don't actually get access to all these, these intermediate points. There is a website called vfont.com, which lists pretty much every variable, fonts in, every variable font in existence. It's very, you can scroll down and load more fonts, and it becomes progressively slower because it actually re loads all these fonts in the same page. But it's very interesting that you can uh, use these sliders to play with it and see how each of these fonts works. And here, for example, you can see that this one doesn't just have a weight axis. It also has a width axis. Is the, is the font extended, condensed? Like, traditionally, we only get access to like, a few keywords, condensed, normal, extended, that kind of thing. With variable fonts, we can have an entire continuum. Same with slant. Instead of just having oblique and normal, we can have the entire continuum. And there's all sorts of crazy stuff you can do. For example, this designer here made this experimental font. It only has one character. But so it's a color font. How many of you have heard of color fonts? So we're going through a revolution in typography right now. We can have variable fonts, which give you access to the entire continuum of type, of, of type design in that font. And we also have color fonts, which are fonts that have where each glyph is colored. Each glyph has multiple colors. And depending on the format, you can even customize these colors from the outside. This is not a talk about color fonts, so I'm not going to go into detail about this. But if it sounds interesting, you should Google color fonts, and there's so much to read about it. So this guy combi combined the two concepts, the, the two technologies, and he created a color font, which just has this uh, chocolate ice cream character. And it's also a variable font with a custom axis of variation called cap height. And if you change that axis, the height of its cap changes. And cap height is also a pun, because in font, in, in, in typography, cap height is, is the height of uppercase letters, like caps. But in this case, it's the actual hat of the emoji. So moving away from uh, color fonts, one, uh, one use case I've found personally for variable fonts is making, giving the impression of constant stroke width. When we have a, a, a traditional font, you can see here that even though every div inside my, my heading, like actually, let me show you the HTML again. This is the HTML. It's a heading element with four divs inside it. And this is what the CSS looks like. I mean, I have, I've linked to a font there. Um, I've specified that I want a, a font weight of 300. Um, I, I've specified which font I want, what size, what line height. And I've given each of those divs a different font size so that they all end up having the same width. But because they all have a different font size, their strokes look thicker. Like, look at the R. It looks so much thicker than the rest of the, than the word variable or the word awesome. And fonts also look thicker than variable and awesome, because that's what happens when you make a shape bigger. Its fonts also become thicker, which is why they tell you never to fake small caps, because you get this, uh, this kind of ugly effect. This, is not, this, this has nothing to do with variable fonts. This is just a, the normal effect of making the font size bigger. However, because this is a variable font, I can fix it. Whereas with normal fonts, you can't really fix it easily. I can go here and say font weight. I can start from the 300 it already has and go down until I find something that looks right. And similarly here, I can start from 300 and go down. And I think it starts looking right about here, maybe 70 or 80. So 
Yeah, I think I like 70 more. And at, and, and at this point, they all look like they have the same stroke. I had to use different weights to, to achieve that, but they all look like they have the same stroke. And actually, this manual process may be acceptable if it's just like the main heading of a website and you only need to do it once. But if you need to experiment a lot and you need to change it a lot, it can become quite tiresome to have to adjust basically two variables. You have to adjust the font size and then find the right font weight. And it, it can get tiring. So I wondered, is there any way to compute what's the right font weight based on the font size for this font? So if you think about it, we have three data points here. We know that when the font weight is 300, then, the font, uh, then th when the font size is 1ms, like the, the font size of the parent, then we have a font weight of 300. If the font size is 1.5ms, then we need the font weight of 190. And when our font size is 2.7ms, then we have a font weight of 70. So there is actually a way in math, when you have a few points and you want to get a function that gives you a value an approximation of a value for anything in between or even outside these points, there is a way in maths to do it. It's called regression. It sounds scary, but actually you don't have to compute it yourself. There are websites that give you, uh, that, that compute it for you. You just put in your points and they give you what the function is. But first, so this is basically what regression is. You have a few points, let's say four here, and you want to find a function that goes as close as possible to each of them. The thing called linear regression basically gives you a line that tries to be as close as possible to them. And obviously, because it's a line, it can't go through all of them, but it does try to be as close as possible. And in some cases, it will be acceptable. As, as the closer your points are to an actual line, the more acceptable it will be. In other cases, it may not be acceptable. So there's also quadratic regression. What, which is a little more complex, and it gives you a sec what, what is called a second-degree polynomial, uh, which is basically a parabola that goes like this. So how can we use this in CSS? So let's go back here. And I've, there is a website called Wolfram Alpha that lets you calculate all sorts of complicated math stuff. And I've actually put it into an iframe here. And let's add all our points. So we know that when our font size is 1.5, uh, then the weight is 190. Yeah, this iframe keeps refreshing as I'm typing, which is a little annoying before I've finished. And when it's 2.7, then we want 70. And this is basically the, what we have to write in Wolfram Alpha. You can see it here. And it, it, it shows us what the fit is. And it shows us what's the actual equation. We can click plain text to copy it. And then how do we apply this to our CSS? I mean, OK, we have this equation now, but how do we apply it to CSS? So first off, we would need to express our font size in variables. We'll define a size variable, and we'll convert this to size. And because we want the number, we will actually remove the m part. And here, we will calculate we will get the size variable we have and multiply it by 1m. And you can see now we have the same result we had already. And then we can also have a weight variable. And we can go here and say font weight var weight. And this also gives us the result we already had. But we don't actually want a weight variable. We want to be able to express this without a weight variable based on size. So we start with calc. Come on. And then we paste in here what Wolfram Alpha gave us. And what is our x here? We only have one variable, really, size. 
And then we can remove the weight variable. And it, just, it works just the same. And that is just with a linear fit, which is like just a line. You saw how far it was from our actual points, but we don't really see the differences. It still looks OK. You know when we start seeing the differences? If we want to go maybe outside these points, let's add a, a, a fifth line here. Let's add a line that says, am I right, folks? And let's go here and add some CSS that styles this to be smaller. Let's say this small. So as you can see, it's better than nothing. If I didn't have any adjustment on the font weight, it would be much worse. But it's not great. You can still see that it's, it's, it's getting a bit it's smaller. And this is where quadratic regression can become useful. So if I change that query, let's go and see it bigger. Oh, come on. So if I change that query to say quadratic fit instead of linear fit, then it gives me this second degree polynomial. I can go here and copy it. And it's basically the same logic as before. Yes, it's a, it's, a it's a slightly more complex formula, but it's the same logic as before. I, I can go here. Actually, let me do it separately so you can see what's happening. I start the calc. I'll paste it here. This is what Wolfram Alpha gave me. Let's make it multiple lines so we have plenty of space. And then I replace x with times var size, and then don't pay attention to the weird stuff that's happening in the meantime. And then var size again, because that was x squared. And now I can remove the previous one, because we don't need it anymore. We're overriding it. And you can see that now it's much better. The now it looks like every line has the same stroke width. And what's, what's more, let me make this into a line. So. I can actually copy this code and apply it to a completely different example. Here, I have some HTML which is doing this, typ this typographic sin of doing fake small caps and fake superscript characters. If you have, in, in proper typography, when you use small caps, you're supposed to use small caps that are specially designed for being displayed in that size, in a smaller size, and their, their strokes are thicker, so you don't actually see their strokes being thinner. And it's not as bad on that screen, but if you look at it an, at an actual laptop screen, it looks much worse. Uh, and you can see it's more, more on the superscript because it's even smaller, and it looks, the, the, the strokes look much, much thinner. It doesn't look uniform. However, I can use the code I already had from the previous example, because it's the same font. And now let's go and define these in terms of size and remove the M part. And you can see that it works. Even in this case, even though I didn't design this, uh, I didn't write this code knowing about this case. Because it's quite flexible. It just computes the, the right font weight based on the font size. So. Some takeaways from this section. The weight access in variable fonts allows us to equalize strokes across different font sizes. Um, and we can use linear or quadratic regression to avoid calculating the weight every time. You don't, have, you don't have to calculate the regression yourself. Honestly, I don't even remember how to calculate the regression. Wolfram Alpha does the work for you. So the seventh thing I wanted to share with you today is, is called responsive flex. And what do I mean by that? Here I have a component. Uh, it's, it's basically an article element. Let's assume it's like a blog comment or a forum post or something like this. And it has uh, a header element, which contains the name and the picture of the author, and a div with a class of post, which contains the actual post. And it's laid out with Flexbox. You can see the relevant code here. The post has flex one, so it occupies the remaining space. 
And you can see that if I resize it, then it also works. Although, if I can also make it very, very small, and then it looks horrible. How can I fix that? I can go here and say flex wrap wrap. And then, when I make it really small, at least it's laid out top to bottom instead of, on, instead of side by side. However, notice that the author details part, actually, let me make this a little darker so you can see what's going on. It looks less pretty now, but at least you can see it. So even though it's laid top to bottom now and it's more readable, like the line didn't get as, as short, it kind of looks ugly, like the, the header doesn't stretch to occupy the entire width. So how can we fix that? Well, we can, we can say that the header can be flexible as well, and that fixes it. But then we broke the normal layout. Now they're both equally, now they both have equal widths because they have the same number, of, the same flex number. However, because flex is relative, I can actually increase this. And if I increase it sufficiently, I usually like something like this, or even this. And then we basically have the same effect, except it looks the, w the same way it, did it used to when we have a side-by-side -side layout, but it also works when we have a top-down layout. However, notice that it still gets quite narrow before it wraps. We don't actually want this, ever. So how can we fix that? Well, it turns out that normal CSS properties from CSS2 and CSS1 still work. They don't just go away. We can actually just use a min width on the post and say 10 ms. And that way, we also control the breakpoint. We control when it switches the layout. So it's kind of a very special version of container queries, which many people want, and we can't really get them yet. So. The seventh set of takeaways, the flex wrap allows your layout to become vertical if there is no space left. And flex is relative. Any positive flex value makes the element stretch. The original version of this comes from what, what it was called Flex Grow 999 hack by Joran Van He. There's his Twitter account. How many of you have used CSS Grid? OK, I'll try to explain um, a few things about it before I show you this. So here we have a list of articles inside a div with a class of creatures. And notice that each of those article elements has two classes, uh, either a class of cat or human and a class of male or female. So. We haven't applied any layout code really there. And you can see that once I apply grid, nothing happens because I haven't specified what my columns are, what my rows are. I need to define at least one of those things. So we can say grid template columns. And if we say one FR, one FR, it basically, the FR unit is basically as much space as you have. Occupy that in a relative way based on the numbers of FRs you have. So in this case, they would both be equal width columns, because both of them are sized in FRs. Um, and notice that now we already have two columns, but they're sort of based on source order. However, I, I, what I wanted was to sort the cats on the first column and to sort the humans on the second column. And that, if I try that, it sort of works, but what about this hole in the second column? It turns out that this is because, by default, automatic grids are laid out by a row. We can, however, we can change that with the grid autoflow property. By default, it's row, which gives you this effect, this, this result. But if we change it to column, it's laid out in a, in a, in a column-based way, so we get the result we wanted. And it's very flexible. We can reverse these, and it works. We can change how we order things, and it still works. Like now, it's the males that are in uh, the, the second column, regardless of whether they are cats or humans, and it's the females that are in the first column. 
And we can also swap these, and it still works. So basically, we can have a complete layout that's completely independent of the source order. However, a note about accessibility. If the order is relevant, uh, if you would want st screen readers to read things out differently based on the order, then you have to still do it with, H with the HTML. You cannot just do it with CSS, because the screen readers will always read the, sc the source order. They will ignore what grid layout you have or whatever. Like they w here, they will always read vector first and cheeky second and Sir Adam Catlay's third, regardless of what grid properties you have. So that is something to keep in mind. In some use cases, that's acceptable. In others, it's not. Another case of the grid auto flow property. So here I have a bunch of images, all of which are cats. Right now, they're all sized based on whatever their intrinsic size is. And I have display grid here, but it doesn't do anything because I haven't specified a template in any way. I can say grid template columns. Uh, I can use the repeat function so I can avoid typing the same thing multiple times. And then I want to have four rows as well, also 200 pixels. And actually, repeating things is bad, so I'm going to define a variable here. And then I'm going to use the variable. Repeating things is bad because if I wanted to change this, for example, I would have to change it in two places. It's a pain in the ass. Um, so now you can see that still nothing is happening. All right, and also I wanted to define the entire template. That's why I had the slash. So you can see that they're sort of starting to form a grid, but your images are cropped. Like you would expect them to occupy their entire grid column. The reason, this works, uh, the, the, the reason this works that way is that images are what we call replaced elements. They have their own dimensions, and grid doesn't override that. You have to do it manually in a way. So if I say width 100% here, I do get them to shrink down, but they still have their aspect ratio, so I get weird gaps. I could say width uh, height 100%, but then they stretch, which is awful, right? Doesn't that like make your skin crawl? I can use object fit, cover, and then they, they're, they are cropped. They become just as big enough to fill their grid cell, and the rest is cropped. And now I want to make my grid a little bit more interesting. So I want to make some of these images uh, occupy two, uh, two columns and two rows. So let's select the third one, the one whose SRC attribute contains three. And then I can say grid column end. And if I say span two, it doesn't matter which column it's in, it will always span two columns. All right, and I need to use quotes here. I mean, if I said three, it would span three columns and so on, but I want two. And similarly, I can say grid row end, and then it spans two rows as well. And this doesn't look very nice with the last kitten just hanging, in the last, uh, hanging out in the last row by itself. So let's make another one bigger, too. For example, this one. So now we have a nice square, but it also has a hole in the, m in the middle, which doesn't look very nice. Can we fix that? Just like in the previous example, when we have holes, grid auto flow can often help. And here, we don't need to change row to column. We can just specify the keyword dense which tells the browser it's OK to shift elements upwards to fill in any holes. And in fact, you can also type row dense, which is actually the default you get if you don't, if you don't include row or, or column. And you can also have column dense. You can combine the two values we've seen. And then you get a layout that's column-based and dense. And you can see it's a different layout than what we had. Let me remove it again. You can see it's, it's a different layout, but they're both, they both solve the problem. If you're wondering about the browser support of CSS Grid, it's very good. 87% of users globally, almost, actually almost 88%, supported by every single browser. It has been for a while. 
And object fit has, has been supported by every browser for even longer, so it's like 90%. I mean, there's always, even, even with border radius, which we consider like pretty normal these days, there are still browsers that don't support it. Like this, nothing will get to 100%. Like when you're at 90%, it's, it's really, really good. Like you can pretty much depend on it. And there's always progressive enhancement, graceful degradation, always good things. So to recap, Grid autoflow defines the direction that automatic grids are laid out. Grid autoflow doesn't really make a difference when you've placed all your elements to a specific column in a specific row, but it does make a difference when you are depending on the, on the rules of automatic grid layout, like we were. We weren't specifying grid column and grid row on every single thing. That would be a pain. The dense keyword prevents holes, and object fit cover prevents image distortion. So you can have images at whatever dimensions you want with no, dim with no distortion. So another thing I wanted to sh share with you is pie charts. How many of you have used linear gradients in CSS? OK, so linear gradients work like this. Uh, you use the linear gradient function with the color stops you have. Uh, this is like the most basic form. You can also specify the position of the color stops. And it looks like this. Uh, I mean, you can also have vertical gradients that go to right, for example, and things like that. Um, rad linear gradients and radial gradients, which are the ones that are concentric circles, they've been in CSS for like many, many years, at least since 2010. Um, but now recently we got a new gradient type called conic gradient. And why is it called conic gradient? It's, by the way, Photoshop calls that angle gradient. It's called a conic gradient because it looks like a cone with the right, co with the right color stops. It kind of looks like a cone viewed from above. And you could even rotate it with the from argument. And then you have the light on different places. So you might be wondering, how is that useful? Let's say if I have a linear gradient here that creates a rainbow, let me change this to a conic gradient. Does that remind you of anything? It's a hue wheel. If you've used a, a, a round color picker, you've used one of those. But I assume most of you are not really making color pickers. So what other uses are there? Let's restrict this to, a few, to fewer colors. And let's add some color stop positions. And let's start moving these color stops closer together. What happens when they meet? We get a hard color stop. So we just have basically two slices with two different colors. And notice that actually I can keep reducing this, and it still works, as long as it's smaller than the, uh, or equal to the previous color stop. So I usually just use zero and to make sure that no matter what this is, it will create a hard color stop. And I can even use a CSS variable for this. And I can go here and refer to that variable. And you might be wondering, how is this better than just saying 40% right in our CSS? Well, because we can define this, we can use this as a normal CSS property. We can go here and use it in the inline style. We could set it with JavaScript. We could, we could set it in any, it's as dynamic as any CSS property. And we could also specify a default value because you can see that now that I didn't define my variable, everything disappeared. We don't want that. So if we set a default value of zero, at least we get an empty pie chart. And let's add this back. We can also have multiple segments. Let's add another variable for 50%. And we can go here and say yellow, green, from zero to whatever var value two is. And now we have three segments. And the good thing is we can set them independently. If I remove this, I still get a pie chart with just one segment. If I remove this, I still get a pie chart with one segment. Or I can have a pie chart with two segments, and so on. And I could have like value 2, value 3, value 4, value 5, as many as you, you want. And then you can basically have a pie chart component and set the values with JavaScript, with templating, through the HTML, whatever you want. It's, and it will be like a flexible pie chart component that just adapts to everything, to whatever you're doing. 
And yes, I'm using component in the more colloquial way here. I'm not using a framework with components or anything, but it's still a component if you reuse it with different parameters. But if you wanted to make it a custom element, you could. Now, some of you might be wondering, can I animate this value variable? Let's try to do that. Let's define a keyframes animation. Let's call it not Spain, spin. I swear I did not plan this. Uh, and let's say the value goes from whatever it was to 100%. So basically, we want something that increases the value f uh, f up to like 100% like this. So let's see, will it work? Let's use animation, spin, one second, infinite. So you can see that it sort of worked, but not quite. We don't get any animation. We just get value 0%, and then at some point, it just swaps to value 100%. Why does this happen? This happens because we're, using a, we're animating a custom property, and the browser is like, oh, I don't know what type you have there. I cannot interpolate it. I, like, the, even though we've specified percentages as the values, the browser pretends that they don't really know what value we have there and what we're trying to animate between. We can help the browser by using a little bit of JavaScript, and soon we can, hopefully, eventually, we can do this in CSS. I won't say soon, but eventually. So if we run this little bit of JavaScript and we go back, now we did get our animation. And notice that in, our, in this little bit of JavaScript, we had to say, we had to register the property, say what its name was, what its syntax was. Here we say it's a percentage, its initial value is zero, and that it doesn't inherit. And then it worked. Let's also give it alternate so that it reverses at the end. Yeah, that's better. So that worked. Um, sadly, Conic Gradient doesn't have amazing browser support, but it's better in terms of market share than you would expect by looking at this chart. Because at this point, Chrome has gotten such a huge market share that then basically just Chrome and the super new version of Safari supporting it still gives us almost 60% of users. Sadly, when it comes to register property, which you need to animate custom properties, things are much, much worse. Oh, CSS variables are supported everywhere, 86%, in case you were wondering. But the registering property to animate them that has very, very bad browser support. Basically, it's only supported in Chrome and Safari and only behind the flag. So you can't use this in production. You can use it in demos and get excited about when it's going to come, but it, it's not here yet. So conic gradients are coming, however. They're basically, they have 60% support. Uh, another thing to remember for every gradient type is a color stop at zero creates hard lines regardless of the previous one's position. And also, CSS variables help us create flexible components. We can modify them with JavaScript, and CSS just adapts. And CSS register property will allow us to animate custom properties eventually when it's supported. And the last thing I wanted to share today, um, I called it descend on grid items, which doesn't make much sense by itself, but it, it's better explained with an example. So here I have a login form, which looks kind of horrible right now. It's a form element with two children, two labels. Um, and each of those contains an input and some text for what the input is for the label of the input. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to have a grid where my two inputs are aligned and their labels are also aligned. And it's one line per, per label and input. So let's try to do that with grid. My first thought would be to use display grid and see, now they all go into the same column, but we didn't exactly want that. Let's say, let's define our columns. So we want the, the label column to, to be sized based on its contents. So let's say auto. And then we want the second column to get the rest of the width. So let's say 1FR. So in our model of what should be happening, this should just work, but it doesn't. You can see that now we just got one line with everything there. Why doesn't this work? The browser actually told us, uh, did what we told it to do. It's just that we didn't really want the browser to do that. 
If you look at the HTML, we have a form element with two children, the two labels. But we forgot about the labels. So we were hoping to have the, 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 the actual text of the label and the inputs be part of the grid. But those are inside the labels. It's, it's the labels that become our grid children, it, uh, our grid items. So the two labels, one of them uh, took the first column, the second label took the second column. But that's not what we wanted. Basically, what we wanted was to tell the browser, could you please ignore this label and just put the contents of the label in the grid? So it turns out we can actually do this today. There is a, a value for the display property called contents. And this basically tells the browser, completely ignore this element. Finish, uh, do whatever you would do if this element was not there. And it does mean it. If you say, for example, background red on the label, that won't work either because I have display contents and the browser is ignoring it. But in this case, it's, it's basically what we wanted because now it's the text of the label and the inputs that take part of the in the grid. And let's give it some grid gap as well to make it look nicer. Yep. Another use case for display contents is, let's say you have a header on your website and you want the contents of the header to take part of the grid and not the actual and not the uh, just and not the actual header element you can apply display contents to the header eventually th this is sort of a hack and eventually the new version of grid will allow you to do this in a better way but for now display contents does work um, its browser support looks like this it's about 3 quarters of users globally a little bit more than 3 quarters so Fallbacks are still important. And uh, the last set of takeaways, display content allows us to make descendants flex, uh, uh, allows us to make descendant elements, not children, but descendants, flex or grid children. And as we've seen before, but also here, text nodes are flex uh, or can be flex or grid children too. Like the text in the label wasn't its own element. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Come talk to me afterwards. Oh, yeah, yeah, if, you, if we have time, of course. Anyone wants to ask something? I will also be around um, afterwards if you want. I, I, and I have stickers too, if you, if, if you want. <laughs> Good. But yeah, we can have a Q&A too.